Hello all, I hope you are doing very well in these unprecedented times. Welcome to the Fintech Finance Virtual Arena where we are joined today. I'm going to go for it, Nina Kirkjes. Is, is that... That's, I'll, that's, I'll, that's good. That, that worked. Yeah, that worked. That's fine. I'll, 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 take that. I'll tell you that. We're joined by Nina from LexisNexis Risk Solution. How are you doing today, Nina? Wh whereabouts in the world are you? I'm in London. I'm stuck in my little uh, four walls in my flat in London uh, with my puppy, which was a lockdown puppy, like many other people uh, have decided to do that. But yeah, definitely not a lockdown decision, but uh, but a lockdown puppy. Uh, so what, what kind of puppy? Uh, he's a toy poodle. I've sent him with a borrow my doggy um, girl so that he can let us actually do some work. Otherwise, he'd be jumping in the background over there. Oh. <laughs> Um, we want to talk a little bit around, um, well, we're going to be talking about a lot of things today, but one of the things I want to kind of kick off the discussion with is financial inclusion. Um, and by that, I don't just mean, first of all, um, to our friends, if there's anyone from Kuda Bank watching, congratulations on passing the million customers in Nigeria. Um, fantastic. That's a great example of financial inclusion. That's getting everyone a bank account. But it's not just about that. Financial in inclusion is, in my opinion, it's the cornerstone as to what fintech is about. But at its fundamentals, how would you um, how would you describe what financial inclusion is and how that that definition has really changed over the last five ten years? Yeah. So financial inclusion definitely kind of means um, that individuals and businesses have access to useful and affordable financial products, um, financial services, um, and all of those are supposed to obviously meet their needs. Um, and, and when I talk about financial services and products, it's you know your classic transactions, payments, savings, credit cards, um, and so on. And so those are supposed to be delivered responsibly to consumers, um, whether those consumers are individuals or businesses. Now, being able to have access to um, a transaction account, so your kind of current account is the first step in that financial inclusion. So just, just what you mentioned there uh, absolutely helps with um, financial inclusion. Um, and that kind of allows people to store money. It allows people to send money and to receive payments. But financial access, um, in essence, facilitate, facilitates our day-to-day -day, um, lives. It helps families, it helps businesses plan for, um, you know, kind of their objectives long-term, um, for their goals and for unexpected emergencies. Uh, we all have been put in a situation, situation like that fairly recently, unfortunately, with the pandemic. Um, and un unfortunately, a lot of people have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. But with that, we're hopeful that, you know, given that they have been financially included, they do have some savings which will help with that um, emergency. Now, as account holders, people are more likely to then use other financial services. So they're more likely to apply for credit, they're more likely to apply for um, insurance, um, they can start businesses, invest in their own education, invest in health, um, and, and ultimately financial inclusion improves our quality of life and, and everybody's lives. According to World Bank, um, there have been a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of actually movement in this space. So there are a lot more people that are now financially included in comparison to what we've seen, as you said, um, five to even 10 years ago. Um, now. Um, in the last 10 years, 1.2 billion adults worldwide have gotten access to accounts. Um, so that's kind of the, the last 10 years movement. Uh, so almost 70% of the population has access to a bank account. But there is still that, um, you know, almost a third um, of adults, so 1.7 billion, again, according to, to World Bank, are those that are still unbanked and those that don't have the access to some of these traditional products um, in the financial world that I have been talking about. So that's really where the challenges are um, today when we talk about financial inclusion. I am so glad that as well as individuals, you said uh, uh, businesses as well. Businesses, yeah. That's often like a completely overlooked overlooked element of it. I, can, I remember about five years ago chatting to the guys at, uh, at Penta um, who had in the UK and they were saying, yeah, we just want to open up a business bank account. It, it, it shouldn't be this hard. Yeah. I mean, I kind of have a bit of a funny story. 
about my dad. I don't know if I can tell this, but uh, I mean, I can definitely tell this. So I shouldn't be going down this path. But yeah, my, da- my dad has a business that's a UK registered business, but he's not a UK resident. Um, him and his partner operate within the EU. Um, uh, and my father is not an EU member. He doesn't come from, from an EU country. Um, and they have been struggling to open a bank account in the UK uh, for their business, simply for the reasons um, that I just mentioned, that he's not an EU member. Um, and therefore, you know, as soon as he starts applying, it's kind of like all sorts of like red flags and alerts popping up. Uh, but they're legitimate, you know, they're a legitimate business. Their the information about them is fully available on companies' house. They post their financials. Everything's operating fully legitimately. But still, they're struggling to... Um, you know, open an account in the UK, which just, you know, is, is making it a lot harder for them to to do business. Uh, well, at that time within the European Union, now I don't even know what's going to happen with Brexit. That's a whole other story. But, you know, um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. It's definitely um, an overlooked section. Um, one thing I always find um, fascinating is when you start to get a digital record, you can then have, have that data and that data kind of lowers the level of risk when things for lending. And I mean, th- there's ever increasing ways to improve people's access to financial services and it all comes down to mitigating risk against that. How, how, um, how does this kind of play into, into financial inclusion in terms of lowering the over- overarching risk and where data plays in that? Yeah. So improved access to kind of financial services overall improves economic outcomes in most cases, right? So it's not surprising that we are seeing developing economies actually invest a lot in making financial inclusion their priority. There are a lot of fintechs, there are a lot of micro lenders that are appearing in the market and there are other institutions that are similar to them. They're all trying to kind of improve this financial inclusions. I think where we have to ask ourselves, especially as an industry, how we're doing is when it comes to um, large scale financial institutions. So what are they doing to improve the financial inclusion? And we know that kind of as an industry, uh, we need to screen our customers when we're onboarding them. What that means is we need to understand who they are as a part of that onboarding process. Um, so as a financial institution, which is um, normally regulated, they need to understand who their customer is. And what, have, what we have kind of seen over the years is that there is more scrutiny on what that process looks like. Um, But there is also more scrutiny on what uh, is kind of deemed as an an acceptable individual or business. So similar to the story I just told about my father, um, you know, it it kind of, there there are things that are considered red flags or um, higher risks for businesses when we talk about financial inclusion or onboarding. So issues arise when somebody is deemed risky um, and it's often often based on those background checks, lack of credit in that country, um, you know, short um, residence in that country. Let's say you're a student, you just moved here, you're trying to open a bank account and you're struggling because there is no data on you. I don't know uh, where you came from, but, you know, you don't have a lot of data uh, that's linked to you in this country. And so therefore, all of these elements uh, present this person as kind of a risky person for the business. So what we see is that, you know, entities, whether individuals or businesses are being rejected from being allowed to have access to financial services. Uh, But in fact, what happens there is that increases the risks of wrongdoings and actually doesn't allow us to learn more about that person and their financial behavior. So if we don't include them in the financial system, we're only, you know, not going to learn about them. We're going to know less about their behaviors, especially online. Um, and and then these individuals, uh, if we are talking about individuals, are more likely to start moving cash and operate in kind of cash-only ways in society. Um, they're not really allowed to uh, rent properties or struggle to rent properties. Um, they have no access to healthcare, so on and so forth. So we are creating a lot of um, societal issues with that. So in a roundabout way, <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that data is very important. Data is the king. And I know like people have been talking about that for a really long time, but we really need to rely on data and information to kind of try and understand, um, you know, about people, to try and understand about businesses, um, to help onboard them and understand the risks that 
true risks that actually are associated with them. And often risks of an average individual are very, very low. And, um, you know, when we think about what it is that we could be looking for is potentially some alternative um, data and some alternative behaviors. So, uh, you know, whether it's their online behaviors, their likes, their dislikes, um, you know, kind of knowing the customer in such way can absolutely help mitigate those risks um, uh, with, you know, th that the financial institution could be facing. Um, I am conscious that issues around data privacy exist. So there are, there are a lot of data privacy regulations out there, but we need to be thinking of what it is that we're trying to achieve. So we are trying to eliminate some large societal issues with this. Um, and in those kind of cases, um, uh, I guess, um, you know, helping deal with these societal issues should be trumping some of those um, data privacy challenges. And I'm sorry to use the Trump word, but I couldn't think of any other word to, to use there. No, no, that, that, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> see, see, see I, I was thinking, you know, as a bank, you, you just you just let, you know, Experian or Equifax, just, just let, them, let, let them deal with it. Well, what are some of the other alternative parts of data that banks need to have? Because they should have a huge amount of transaction history and no a lot more about you than perhaps Experian or whoever may do. Yeah. So, what, well, in order to kind of be scorable by these credit bureaus, you have to have a credit data footprint. So you need to be actively participating in a banking and credit system. And the issue here is that, you know, these people aren't. So alternative data refers to um, a data set that could be used for um, credit decisions and fraud decisions. Um, and, and some of those alternative data sets could be very, uh, like a lot of different things. So public and institutional data, such as educational history, uh, such as criminal history, any kind of professional licensing. So, you know, I have a chem certification, for example, um, you know, I've studied, I have a couple of masters. So like, you can kind of look at my, my history and see whether, um, yeah, well, what that looks like really. Um, you could be looking at property assets, some ownership assets ar around properties. Um, you could be looking at the locations of where these people are um, living. So there are often kind of um, e economic traje trajectories that are associated with um, the locations. Um, you could be looking at some court data as well. So. Uh, you know, back, bankruptcies, evictions, and, and that kind of stuff um, that could indicate um, and showcase um, some other alternatives when it comes to risk scoring um, individuals and businesses. And, and also, I really do want to touch on digital data. And I think digital data is so important for us, especially in, in trying to um, kind of deal with the challenges of, of credit risk and fraud. And when I talk about digital data, it's about somebody's digital behavior. So what does my digital behavior look like? You know, where am I accessing my accounts from? Um, you know, which which um, which kind of tools am I using to um, operate online? Uh, you know, looking at all sorts of information that we could gather now digitally um, to understand this person and potentially some of their behaviors online. So. Uh, I guess um, as a result um, of kind of not, uh, so, so kind of going back to those, those credit institutions, so as a result of, um, you know, not giving or not including people in um, the financial system, uh, we end up with underserved customers and they will actually lack traditional credit portfolios and they will be um, unscorable by these kind of traditional credit data sources. Um, they could therefore be declined mortgages, loans, um, any other um, uh, you know, financial services that are very important. And what we um, do at LexisNexis Risk Solutions, but there are a lot of other um, kind of alternative data vendors popping up in the market as well. We build risk scores and they allow our customers to look at numerous kind of alternative data assets that I've just mentioned. And so therefore, um, you know, financial institutions could make an informed credit risk decision. And of course that will help increase um, that financial inclusion and transparency. Absolutely, and it also again, opens up a lot of, well, of other doors. Um, the, um, the, the joke I always hear is my, my bank won't trust me to pay 800 
pounds on a mortgage every month. So uh, I'm now paying, uh, or as I have for the last few years, uh, 1,200 a month. With, um, with this in mind, how will alternative data using say something like the rental space and mortgages, for example, how will that improve financial inclusion for those that already have a bank and already can show that data? How can, how can that data that the banks have be used to go, actually, we should probably give this guy a mortgage because he's been paying, you know, an extra, you know, 125 or 150%, whatever, uh, for the last few years. Yeah, since, 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 since I've been given a mortgage, mortgage, I've realized how many other expenses there are that are linked to it. So I'm not sure about that one, but I, I absolutely get what you're saying. <laughs> Um, I was also one of the frustrated uh, payers of rent for a long time myself in London, and that's not that's not a cheap le- uh, rent. So, um, kind of speaking to um, the alternative data assets that I've touched on, um, you know, if if I as a financial institution could understand my customers' behavior and un- I understand their behaviors and spending, I've included them in the financial um, system. Um, that data is exactly what can help serve these underserved customers. So one of the key use cases for alternative data has been the ability to kind of rank order consumers who have not had that traditional um, credit data footprint. Um, and at LexisNexis, again, um, you know, we have done some analysis and the analysis that we perform specifically in this field demonstrates that one in four consumers in the general population can fall in this group. So they are kind of underserved in in the financial world. Um, And the highest scoring of those uh, one in four consumers, so 64% of them, actually represent the low risk population. So that low risk population is um, you know, likely to be good and profitable customer uh, for lenders and credit card issuers. Uh, but lenders, credit card issuers, uh, and financial institutions in general have to be using that alternative data and they have to be looking at the alternative data to understand that customer in such way rather than just some of the traditional data elements um, which we have seen in the market for many, many years. So it simply indicates that credit worth in, uh, worthiness um, you know, well, that these underprivileged customers perhaps are credit worthy. So, um, you know, they, they could also be uh, profitable for, for their business as well. Absolutely. Um, I want to kind of look at, well, there's two examples that spring straight to mind uh, for the kind of the next point. Um, Alipay and WeChat Pay in China, um, phenomenal way of starting to get data on what was way back when a predominantly cash focused society but also uh, New Bank in Brazil, which is quite possibly one of the most successful neo banks out there. Um, with such a dramatic impact that these types of organizations have had in their, in their domestic markets and building up that improved data file on everyone, could this um, sort of snowball credit, if you like, in a greater fintech revolution than we've seen with just kind of neo banks and current accounts? What's kind of the, the scope? Uh, of what could be achieved by banks mitigating risk and using data in well, using the data they already have on file in a very sensible way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you, you mentioned those businesses and, and as well, some of the other tech giants, you know, if they kind of considered helping this space, they could really have a significant impact on financial inclusion, but it's not their priority. It's not their core business, so they don't, but they, you know, sit on the wealth of data. And as I said, data is is king in all of these situations. So, uh, you know, I mean, the alternative data is there. Uh, So what we uh, need as an industry is definitely more awareness, um, kind of better usage of this alternative data. So potentially, I guess there could be a significant impact, but we also live in a world in which financial um, stability is currently shaken. We um, are, you know, kind of potentially coming out of a pandemic. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of scared to say that, but, you know, uh, we are facing some difficult times, especially as we do start coming out of the pandemic. Um, and there will definitely be greater need for lending. Uh, we know that the, you know, job unemployment is at its highest, not just in the UK, but, you know, globally. And so, Will lenders be 
open to that, to actually issuing, um, you know, kind of more loans um, to to these individuals. I don't know. I'm not sure. So what what I think um, we could see certainly is an increase in the fintech sector, is an increase in other alternative uh, micro lenders popping up in the market. However, those also need to be um, vigilant. Uh, they need to also understand their customers. So yes, you're a micro lender, so maybe um, you know it's easier for you to lend, but you should be looking at other data sources um, and alternative data sources to understand your customer so that you mitigate your own risks that are associated um, you know, with, with that prospect customer. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's a tough question to answer, but I think um, it, it's, it's definitely a space to, to watch. And, and I mean, there, there, there could be a, a massive change uh, in, in the fintech, fintech world as we um, start getting out of this 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 crazy situation we're in right now flip side this kind of uh, uh focused on get as much data as you can uh, we did a uh, a study on a on a bank in north america and it, they had a uh, um, a loan ai machine but it would have been fed previous data from from the bank and so various uh, prejudice that was pr on the previous data was then automatically fed through and almost amplified by the kind of the the machine learning around that existing data. What are some of your thoughts on the, on the implications around these types of inequalities um, when it comes to inclusion, but also economic empowerment? Yeah. Um, A nice easy one the, for you. <laughs> I am very passionate about this topic, being a woman working in the financial services space. I mean, I am... Um, look, what we know is that kind of half of the unbanked people include women from poorer households in rural area, areas, women that are out of workforce. It's not just women. There is definitely, um, you know, inequality when it comes to um, to race uh, and, and other um, issues that kind of surround that, um, you know, diversity when it comes to financial um, in, in inclusion. But the gender gap in account ownership actually remains stuck. So again, World, World Bank does a lot of research on this. Um, and this is hindering women from being able to kind of effectively control their financial lives. Um, and, and what we are seeing is that countries that have high mobile money account ownership have less gender inequality. So. Uh, we are kind of hopeful that the, the world will start moving in, in that space. But whilst significant progress has happened in the world of financial inclusion, so as I said, over the last 10 years, uh, we've seen a significant increase in financial inclusion and a lot more people opening accounts. What we know is that um, that kind of gap, um, the gender gap uh, has not decreased. So 72% uh, of men have access to account um, our accounts, uh, while only 65% of women have access to accounts. So uh, that kind of gender gap over the last 10 years absolutely remains unchanged, which is quite um, quite sad to see. And, and also, um, I am conscious that the implications of pandemic could further increase, um, you know, that, that gap. And, and we are seeing a lot more, perhaps, women uh, coming out of uh, workplace to uh, kind of deal with a situation that they could potentially have at, at home, whether it's, you know, homeschooling children or, um, you know, just just dealing with, with the tough life that we're all presented with um, right now. So um, including uh, financial inclusion is important, um, including women in, in, uh, in the financial universe uh, is extremely important, has positive effects on society. Um, women can contribute to growth significantly, uh, they can build businesses, uh, they can also better manage their financial resources, which is very important, you know. Um, I mean, I, I am not very good at this myself, uh, being a woman, uh, you know, we are, we are known to spend more than men on, you know, all sorts of accessories. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it's extremely important to start thinking about, and, and, and I guess there's there's an issue of this kind of, you know, some traditional elements of like men manage money, right? So and it's still, 
you know, we kind of still live in in that uh, in that society, although things are slightly changing, at least in the in the Western world. But extremely important to plan for those, um, you know, to have savings, to plan for those emergencies, to plan for like pensions in future. And we also know that today, traditionally, people don't always stay together until, you know, forever and ever and until, until the end of the li and their lives. So, um, and unfortunately, we don't, you know, we, we see women uh, being left underprivileged in those situations, and that's not what we want. We want them to be um, economically empowered. Um, and we want them to, to, to definitely uh, get involved in, in opening businesses and starting businesses. And, um, you know, women are amazing at, at doing all these things. So uh, we, we need to do better as a society with uh, gender inclusion when it comes to financial inclusion. Absolutely. And taking any kind of, uh, taking morality off the table, it's a big market. I mean, that's a huge opportunity there, just from just fiscally. And, it, and it's also a market that is present in every country in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, well, look, at, I mean, I, I, I talk I talk to women because, as I said, you know, it, it personally affects me and I am, you know, interested in this. Um, the FCA is just about to run a tech sprint that's focused on economic empowerment of women. Uh, it's coming up in March, so I'm really excited to take part in that. Um, they're also looking for women in technology to obviously help with the hackathon, but that's also another challenge. You know, we kind of talk about um, uh, you know, the, the, the jobs that are out there and, and we do live in an, increasing, in an increasingly digital um, world, but women still are underrepresented in STEM and underrepresented in technology. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not great because that's where our jobs are moving. Uh, we're moving away from some of the traditional elements of, you know, kind of the workforce out there. And uh, we need to be able to, uh, to give jobs to to those women as well. So the more diversity we have in teams, not just male, female diversity, um, those teams tend to often perform better because there is just a lot less group think and conforming to um, same ways of thinking. And so teams that are challenged perform better normally. Excellent. Well, Nina, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. I've definitely learned a lot around financial inclusion, but also on, on the risk side of things with data. Um, where is the best place to reach out to yourself? Uh, well, you can contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to find me there. Uh, just go to LinkedIn at slash forward Perkis, if you can spell that. Uh, alternatively, you can you can also contact me on my email, which is nina.perkis at lexisnexisrisk.com, which is a mouthful, but maybe there'll be some writing at the bottom of the screen now as I, as I say this out loud. Do you want to do a quick little... Yeah. Nina.kirkins.com. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.